Hey everyone, I'm Matt Stalford, and welcome back to The Bully Pulpit. This is our fifth episode, and I'd just like to quickly thank everyone who's tuned in, come to an event, or shown us support since we started the show in January. The entire staff is proud of what we've accomplished and can't wait to see how and where we'll continue to grow. So thank you. Now, on this episode, we're going to be discussing one of the most important parts of the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment. Recently, a number of controversies have brought this amendment back to the forefront of public debate. Now, this is nothing new. American history is chock full of clarifications of, and challenges to, the rights laid out for us by the First Amendment. So while this isn't an unfamiliar debate, it's one that's never been more relevant. First, let's take a look at the exact wording of the amendment. It reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Now that sounds simple, but needless to say, the First Amendment is more complicated than the surface reading will show. Like the Constitution itself, the Bill of Rights was the product of years of debate between the Founding Fathers. Madison himself was originally against writing down any specific rights, because he worried that any unwritten yet inalienable rights wouldn't be considered as valid. Still. He and the other Founding Fathers were passionate about formally limiting the power of government. And so Madison eventually wrote the Bill of Rights to officially codify what were in his mind the most important of our rights. This list, and especially the First Amendment, have been critical throughout American history in preventing the kind of government overreach that the Founding Fathers wanted to guard against. But with that said, there are a couple of major clarifications to the First Amendment that have been drawn out over time. Since the language of the amendment is relatively vague and was originally ratified with little congressional debate, the nuances of the amendment had to be tested out over the 200 plus years since its implementation. So to start off, let's take a look at what kinds of things are and are not protected under the First Amendment. The first part, known as the Establishment Clause, mandates that the government cannot favor a specific religion over others. You might also know this as separation of church and state. We see this in public schools being unable to hold officially endorsed prayer sessions and states never enforcing a religion upon their citizens. Up next is the free exercise clause, which means that religious practices are always permitted unless the state has a compelling interest to ban them. Things like religious sacrifice and illegal drug use are, understandably, not allowed. On the other hand, things like religious dress and the right to celebrate your religion's holidays are always allowed. Finally, there's freedom of expression. The last three clauses of the First Amendment all state that the government cannot limit or regulate your expression. Not your speech, not your press's speech, and not your protests. The Supreme Court has ruled that flag burning, student protests, and media criticizing the government are all protected under the First Amendment. And if the government violates any of the rights given to you by the First Amendment, you have a right to appeal it. But when does the government have a compelling reason to limit free speech? History has shown that there are a number of situations in which the government can limit your speech. For starters, you can't incite violence, and you can't advocate overthrow of the government. A good rule of thumb to keep in mind is that the First Amendment guarantees total freedom of speech, unless it poses some kind of danger. Otherwise, the courts have imposed very minimal restrictions on what you're allowed to say. However, this also means that unless violence is being clearly incited, hate groups like the Westboro Baptist Church are also allowed to say whatever they want. That, of course, is where some people start to get uncomfortable, but that comes with the freedom the First Amendment grants us. You don't always like what ends up being said. But now that we've discussed the Constitution's relationship with freedom of speech, let's delve into some more modern controversies to see where the debate stands today. In recent years, debates about free speech have grown increasingly heated and common. There have been a few key events, both on campus and in the workplace, that have shaped how we debate this topic, and I'd like to take a close look at one of them in particular. Hopefully, by examining this event, we can get a better idea of what each side of the debate is concerned about. So let's go back to March of 2017, when economist Charles Murray was invited to speak at Middlebury College. The American Enterprise Institute, a conservative student group on campus, set up the event and even invited liberal professor Allison Stranger to host a talk with him after. He came to discuss his most recent book, Coming Apart, The State of White America. In it, he describes how white American communities have changed over the past 60 years, and his speech was centered around how these changes could explain the rise of President Trump. When he arrived, a crowd of over 400 people, 
most of them students, had assembled to protest his talk. These protesters carried signs which listed their various complaints, but their main criticism centered around one of Murray's older books, The Bell Curve. The Bell Curve was a study of intelligence and its effects on inequality that Murray had co-authored, and his conclusions were highly controversial. He argues that differences in intelligence account for much of the class stratification in American life, that intelligence is partly genetic, and that there may be genetic differences in intelligence between races. Needless to say, his work was not without its critics. So when he began to give his speech, he was quickly shouted down by the crowd. After this continued for 20 minutes, Murray was moved to a private location on campus where a crowd could not interrupt him. The school set up a live stream so students could still attend the talk digitally, and he and Professor Stranger continued their discussion. The protesters then set up outside his private room and waited for him to merge at the conclusion of the talk. As he left the building, him and Professor Stranger were swamped by a crowd of people. When they tried to get into their car, Professor Stranger moved to shield him from the protesters, and one of the students grabbed at her hair and twisted her neck. Eventually, they were able to drive off, but Professor Stranger later had to go to the hospital, where she received a neck brace for her injury. This event demonstrates the fears of both sides of this issue. On the one hand, people are concerned about speech being met with violence, and events like this make that fear a reality. Professor Stranger was forced to go to the hospital, and Charles Murray was prevented from using his speech the way he wanted to. This sets a worrying precedent for many, and their concerns are certainly justified by events like this. Now, on the other side, many of Murray's claims about race in the bell curve have been widely discredited, and these claims reinforce stereotypes that are damaging to many Americans. So from the perspective of these students, Murray's speech is spreading information that is both false and harmful, which they don't feel has a place on a university campus. To them, Preventing Murray's speech is a matter of direct harm prevention, which is understandable from their point of view. Now, this event can be seen as an unsettling omen to some, or an appropriate, if unfortunate, response to injustice to others. Many are left wondering, what does this mean for the exercise of free speech in the future? Will events like this grow increasingly common? The future of the First Amendment appears to be just as controversial as its past. Aside from highly contested campus speeches, Issues of free speech and free press are likely to stay on the forefront of the American political conscious for years to come. This was demonstrated recently when tweets from President Trump encouraged NFL owners to punish or even fire players who kneeled during the national anthem in protest of police brutality. Many critics accused Trump of threatening to violate the players' First Amendment rights, prompting the NFL to officially state that they will not punish players who kneel. Now, as student athletes across the country began to co-opt the protest and kneel for the anthem, some public schools punished students who refused to stand. Critics claim that, as a government entity, any public school system who banned these protests were violating their students' First Amendment right to protest. The controversies surrounding flag protests quickly consumed the news cycle, showing that the hotly debated extents and limitations of our First Amendment rights continue to evolve today. Perhaps most significantly, the rise of the internet and the influx of new types of speech as a result of social media have raised entirely new questions regarding First Amendment rights. Suddenly, we're forced to determine how far our First Amendment protection extends into the online realm. Now, some have argued that due to their huge user bases, social media services like Facebook and Twitter should be committed to tailoring their terms and conditions to protect the constitutional rights of their users. Others argue that as independent platforms, they have no obligation to make any changes to their user policy. Now, social media has suddenly taken over as the space where most speech takes place. Yet the First Amendment provides us with little guidance as to what protections are afforded to these new, vast, and instantaneous forms of speech. It's still unclear whether the rights protected by the First Amendment translate to these new forms of communication. The Supreme Court took a step in interpreting the First Amendment in the context of these new modes of speech earlier this year, when they decided that it was unconstitutional to prevent registered sex offenders from joining social media services. Now, in doing this, the court appears to have chosen to protect social media speech as if it were real-world speech that was carried out in person and in a public space. So as social media companies continue to become folded into all aspects of American life, the court will surely continue to confront new questions on how to ensure that constitutional protections of free speech will survive in the online world. So, now that we have a better understanding of free speech, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. This has been The Bully Pulpit, and I'll see you next month.